Okay, welcome everybody. Good morning to you all and good evening to you in other countries. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Clapper to the interview today. In fact, yesterday I was just, just telling Deborah, I was, um, so this has been um, exhilarating, but at the same time exhausting. And yesterday I was, uh, after speaking with Dr. Will Tuttle, uh, and I had a couple of interviews, a uh, couple of other meetings to attend in the afternoon. I got so exhausted, I went and took a nap and I woke up in the morning today. <laughs> <laughs> you needed it. Okay. I needed it. And then I realized that personal health is so important for us to do our work for the planet. You know, Absolutely. it's only when we heal ourselves that we begin healing the planet. And only when we heal the planet, we start beginning to heal ourselves. So uh, and, uh, I know that uh, Dr. Clapper has been in uh, Cowspiracy, What the Health, and a lot of movies, and he's very well known in the plant-based world. Um, but I met him for the first time in person earlier this year, and I was struck by the compassion that exudes from him. And um, so it's a pleasure. This is why I invited you, because uh, also for the fact that you work with medical students and helping the next generation of doctors to start looking at health in the right way that we really need for a vegan world. You know, because um, uh, we are talking about changing the whole paradigm so that we are not looking at managing diseases, but rather uh, managing wellness. And, and I think that's where healthcare should be as opposed to the way it is uh, implemented today. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you for, for all the work that you do uh, and the inspiration that you, you give to so many people. Thank you, it takes one to know one and you certainly <laughs> inspire me with all that you're doing. This is what a magnificent summit that you're running here and so timely, it's so important. It's a real honor to be part of it, thank you. Thank you. So uh, tell us more about the work that you're doing with the students today uh -huh. uh, medical colleges. Well, I've been a classically trained Western physician for the past 47 years. And for the past 37 of them have uh, been focusing on plant-based nutrition to reverse diseases. And uh, for the past eight years, I've been working at a clinical facility called True North Health Center up in Santa Rosa, California, about an hour north of San Francisco. And it's a wonderful institution and uh, people come in with all the classic Western diseases, the obesity, the clogged arteries, high blood pressure, diabetes, inflammations of every tissue you could imagine. And we put them on a whole food plant-based diet and it works its magic when we feed the body the food it was designed to run on and within days uh, the uh, of eating the salads and the soups and the steamed veggies uh, the obesity starts to melt away and the arteries open up and the high blood pressure comes down and the joints stop hurting and the bowels start working and the asthmatic lungs don't wheeze so much and the migraine headaches get better and they turn into normal, healthy people that uh, don't need a lot of pills and potions and procedures, which is our birthright. We didn't come onto this planet to be medical patients. We came to live full, loving lives. And uh, so I spent those eight years seeing nutritional medicine practiced properly as it should be and got great respect for the discipline. And as much as I enjoyed it, I realized just seeing people one at a time retail there uh, it really is not uh, going to get the job done. I put in right. a full day's work and I've helped maybe eight people and uh, there's a much bigger mission uh, as you and I both know. And uh, I realized that uh, as is the point of your entire summit, uh, we are being called upon as individuals and as a species to evolve to a plant-based diet and get on with it already for all sorts of reasons. And uh, we have, you know, it's evident that this plant-based transition has to take place. But when we look around uh, for what's holding it back, this is, it's not that hard to order the bean chili instead of the beef chili. You know, it's all we're right. talking about. What is holding it back? 
And we all know that there's many social forces, uh, political forces, everything from the comfort foods that we grew up with to the agriculture department, fast food industries, a lot of folks want to keep things as it is. Uh, and I realize, much to my chagrin and dismay, one of the major forces holding back this transition is my beloved profession of medicine. Uh, right. the doctors are woefully, embarrassingly, and ignorant uh, of this, this fundamental aspect of health. Well, we practice medicine like what our patients are eating it has no effect on these diseases. And it, it's stunning the more you think about it. We, uh, uh, I tell the students, we've, uh, we, we treat our patient's diet like, uh, like in, in the Harry Potter movies, the arch villain Voldemort, you know, it has the name that must not be spoken. You know, Ooh, don't ask about the patient's nutrition, don't ask about what they're eating. And I tell the students, yes, ask the patient about what they're eating. And that's why they're sitting in front of you, obese right. and clogged up and hypertensive and diabetic and inflamed. It's, it's from what they're running the, through their blood vessels every few hours in, in this Western diet. And I tell them, before you order another $1,000 scan and another $500 set of blood tests, ask your patient what they ate yesterday. And have them take it through their typical eating day. And if it's full of burgers and buffalo wings and egg McMuffins, then, then that's where to start. And, uh, and that, that gives the doctor the key to why these diseases have happened. And most importantly, it gives the path to, for the patient to follow to, uh, to get their body healthy again. And we can go into the details of it. But I've been going around to the medical schools because uh, I realized that this is the acupuncture point as far as medicine goes. And, I, and I, as I step up to the microphone, um, I tell the medical students, listen, I'm going to give you the, lic the lecture I wish somebody had given me 50 years ago when I was sitting in your seats. I wish someone had told me that you're not going to be seeing smallpox and leprosy. You're going to be seeing obesity and diabetes from what your patients are eating. You know, that's the reality of the medicine you're going to be practicing now. So let's let's get real about the cause and about the true cure for these diseases, and medicine will become fun again. So right. I'll be glad to drill down in, on any aspect of this. But I've been we've started a nonprofit uh, initiative called Moving Medicine Forward, and mm -hmm. uh, if people want to help. We'll tell you how you can do that. Uh, but I've been going around to the medical schools uh, and uh, giving the uh, uh, giving that talk called what I wish I had learned in medical school about nutrition. And I want to turn the plant-based light on for these young students so they go out and practice medicine the way it should be practiced. So uh, I've got a full plate, so to speak, but it's, it's really what I was born to do. I think my whole medical career was to point me in this direction to uh, go back and, uh, and repair this great defect in my education and my colleagues' education. And uh, and uh, I think that's the best kind of medicine I can be practicing these days. That's beautiful. Uh, do you get any resistance to this kind of work from the colleges? Uh, interesting, uh, what, we, what we see here. Uh, knowing very well that uh, this kind of message is, is, is heresy as far as the medical establishment goes. And the, and the uh, faculty, the professors look at it with suspicion. We can talk about why. Um, but uh, I certainly get no support in general, although in every medical school now, there's usually one surgeon on staff or one cardiologist who has the plant-based light go on. Right. But, but seeing that we know the, the resistance that's involved, what we've decided to do is we just do an end run around the administration. We go right to the students. And it's easier to do nowadays because in every medical school class, every first, second, third year medical school class, there's now 15 or 20 students who've seen movies like Forks Over Knives. Ah. They've seen What the Hell, and they've seen Cowspiracy, and the, and the light's on already. They, they get it. And, uh, and so they're the ones that reserve the lecture hall. They put up the notices around the school. They send out the e-blasts. They arrange the samosas from the local Indian restaurant. You got to feed the medical students. <laughs> you want medical students? You got to you got to feed them, uh, and uh, and so they're the ones who do the uh, who actually make the event happen. 
the events are either um, grand rounds on an afternoon or lunchtime mm -hmm. grand rounds uh, for people to discuss um, this issue, uh, or we do an evening program where the public is certainly invited. And we've been getting 100, 150 um, uh, attendees each um, event and uh, mostly medical students, but we've been getting dental students, pharmacy students, nursing students, uh, physical therapists, uh, and the students are really open to it. You, you asked about resistance. Uh, inevitably in the back, uh, there's always the professors standing there with their arms folded and, <laughs> and cluck clucking, uh, but it's too bad that they, they, they've got to come to terms with it on, on their own. The, the reality is it's the truth. and and. And it's, it's unethical to withhold this powerful information from, from our patients, surely, and from these young medical students. Uh, I wish someone had told me this when I was a student and, and we're obligated to share this information with our patients. In fact, I showed them a slide. It's a statement from the uh, Statement of Ethics um, of uh, American Medical Association saying that physicians shall keep abreast of the latest advances in medical science and share this information with their patients. We are mandated to share this. How can we withhold mm -hmm. this? Uh, real people are dying on real operating tables from operations they don't need because this information isn't widely available. And so it really is unethical to withhold this. So, uh, so I want to bring, I want to be the, the bringer of good news and uh, if a couple of sacred cows have to get let out to pasture, well, well so be it. Uh, though they're, they're not doing us uh, any favor. Uh, keeping us from embracing nutrition because uh, that's the key to getting people healthy. Right. So how many doctors are with you who do this kind of work? Because right. we need to clone uh, you, right? Yeah, really. <laughs> I'm looking for that big cosmic Xerox machine to lay down and make about 15 of me and send them out. Uh, seriously, we've been to, uh, let's see, uh, 11 medical schools, uh, University of Michigan, University of uh, Washington, Seattle, uh, McGill up in Montreal, Wright State. Uh, I've been, been to a lot of uh, medical schools and we are getting our next uh, tour together. I'm going to be going to uh, uh, Western State in, uh, in Lebanon, Oregon and Eugene, Oregon, and then down to Stanford and USC. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're making a, uh, our, our next swing through the Western States and then we're going to uh, focus mm -hmm. on the East. And um, the, uh, there's getting, I'm getting a lot of interest actually in, in, from physicians saying, well, I would like to bring this uh, to my school. And mm -hmm. so uh, in my spare time, wink, um, I'm, try, I'm trying to put together a syllabus um, to how to uh, present this to colleagues and to, and to medical staff because uh, we don't want this to be just a one-time drive-by lecture and that just fades into the dark. I, I want these students to start a nutrition interest group and mm -hmm. meet once a month, talk about nutrition-based cases, uh, lead case discussions. I will Skype in and, and lead a case discussion. And we're going to be getting an electronic platform together, probably like Google Hangout, where students from all over the country can tune in once a month and will present a case and and talk about applied nutrition. And then you open it up to uh, the different students at the different schools to share what's working at their school, what's not working at their school, where, where do we think uh, this process has to go. And so I want this to be a, a dynamic ongoing process that really foments a nutritional revolution uh, among our young doctors. Uh, the, uh, the, the, this huge black hole of, of uh, uh, of, of awareness uh, mm -hmm. about these diseases is, is just appalling, uh, and, it's, and it's really it's embarrassing uh, to hear my uh, the, my colleagues. Uh, uh, high blood pressure. We don't know the cause of high blood pressure. Etiology unknown. We don't know the cause of type two diabetes. We don't know the cause of clogged arteries. But those smart guys are working in the labs at NIH and in Harvard, and when they figure it out, they'll make placebo psyllin or a mesocillin that we can give to our patients and they will magically be restored to good health. They're not going to work like that. It's, it's, we, don't, we, don't, it, we don't not know the answer. We do. It's the food that, that we're running through our bloodstream, the meat and the dairy and the oils and the sugars and the processing chemicals. This is a toxic brew and it bubbles up through all the organ systems. 
and mm -hmm. causes dysfunction. And the internist sees the clogged arteries and the, uh, the cardiologist sees the high blood pressure and the endocrinologist sees the, the type two diabetes and the rheumatologist sees the inflamed joints and the dermatologist sees the psoriasis and the gastroenterologist sees the colitis and the Crohn's disease. And they don't realize they're all looking at the same disease. <laughs> it's what your patients are eating, doctor. And, um, and then we run into that second, uh, once you can get past the, uh, the, the wall of, of uh, unknowing there, and then we run into the second tier of resistance. Well, I, the doctor says, well, I don't know anything about nutrition. I wasn't trained anything about it. I don't have time to, to do this kind of counseling. And besides, I don't get paid for it. So right. this is just California woo-woo stuff. I, the, I'm going to do real medicine. Wait, wait till they need that amputation, then, then call me. But that's not fair to the patient. And we can do much better than that. And uh, uh, the good news is that uh, you know, with just some elementary training in, in plant-based nutrition, uh, the doctor sees these diseases go away. And uh, I tell the students, I'm, I'm the happiest doctor I know. My, my patients get healthy right in front of my eyes, right in front of their eyes. And, there, and that is really why we went into medicine was just to help our patients get healthy. So they don't really need us. I, I tell my patients, I want to see you in two places and two places only. I want to see you on the bicycle path and I want to see you at the health food store buying your tempeh. Other than that, I don't want to see you unless you break your arm or something. Um, go live your life and, and eat healthy food. And, and the doctor say, well, we weren't trained in this. And, and this is where a, a beautiful evolution is happening in medicine because um, we are getting now a whole generation of plant-based dietitians. Uh, these are women and men with RD after their name and they're plant-based. They know what you know, sir, and what we're trying mm -hmm. to get across in this seminar. And the beauty of this is that they take away the doctor's excuses because uh, they, when the doctor says, well, I don't have time uh, to do counseling. I don't know anything about it. You don't have to, doctor. There are professionals who will do that counseling for you. All you need to do is recognize you are looking at someone with a nutrition-based disease, that obese, hypertensive, diabetic person in front of you. It's from what they're eating. Send the patient to the plant-based dietitian down the hall. Let her show them the videos. Let her teach them what to eat. Let her take them shopping. Uh, and get them on a plant-based diet and you see them back in a month. And if they haven't lost the weight, which they almost surely would, then, then talk to the dietitian about what the issue is. But, but she's your colleague, work with her uh, and it takes the burden off you and, you'll, and your patient will get those wonderful results. Uh, and, uh, and you don't have to go back to, uh, to nutrition school, but you really should learn a thing or two about this. It's, it's such a powerful, powerful modality. Right. So, um, so I'm trying to get this symphony of medical care going with the with a nutritionally aware physician and then the plant-based dietitians. And, and, and then we want the community to get active. It's so important for people making this transition to have support at home, the support at, uh, in their community. And, and that's happening. We, do, uh, we sponsor potlucks and, uh, and uh, cooking classes. So uh, it's a fertile field and the time is right. It's a matter of uh, getting this word out, which is why uh, uh, summits like uh, yours today are, are just so important. Uh, we honor the work you're doing because as you well know, a plant-based diet is the key to so many things way beyond cholesterol and clogged arteries. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, much right, it's in fact, it's exactly the same uh, analogy in a human relationship with the earth. You know, if you start doing the right thing, the earth will start healing herself. <laughs> Pretty yes, much. The earth knows how to heal if you just uh, give <laughs> right. it a chance. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So how long do you think it would take for uh, lifestyle medicine to become a part of the curriculum? Yeah. In right. Oh, sir. Well, that is the question, of course, on, on right. so many levels. There's, it's a new specialty, lifestyle medicine. And 
Uh, and uh, even in its, its name, we, we run into resistance uh, in that uh, when the, the surgeons say, oh, well, that's not real medicine, it's not cardiology, it's not surgery, yeah, that's California woo-woo stuff. No doctor, it's the most powerful specialty of all because it will cure these patients. It will reverse these diseases. Right. And it, it makes diabetes go away. And, and uh, you know, the... the they're quick to dismiss it. But the reality is, as I speak at meetings, I was at the, the Latin American Conference on Lifestyle Medicine, the Polish Society. I was in Warsaw, Poland, speaking to the Polish Society of Lifestyle Medicine. I'm flying to London this week for, for VegMed and uh, the, the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. There's the Malaysian Society, New Zealand, Australia. The fact is that physicians around the world, all of us, who are practicing lifestyle medicine. All of us have a stable full of patients who used to be obese, who used to have high blood pressure, who used to have diabetes, who used to have lupus, who used to have sore joints, who used to have, used to have, used to have. these diseases go away with a whole food plant-based diet. Insane lifestyle, you gotta stop smoking, gotta get enough rest, yes, yes. But it's the plant-based diet that provides the horses and the engine room there, or whatever analogy, that really makes this go, that makes the body change its physiology and lets these diseases subside. And, and, and so we run into this third obstacle where the professors who I'm giving this lecture will stand in the back of the room, well, show us your 500 uh, double blind placebo controlled studies, uh, you know, convincing me that lifestyle medicine will reverse disease X. And lifestyle medicine, he, it doesn't lend itself to that kind of research. It's not, it's not drug research. You can give a placebo and you can design a study and observe the results, but people know what they're eating. They, you know if you're eating a steak or you're not. And these, this is a long-term process. You'd have to put people on a meat-based diet and a plant-based diet and have them not vary, which humans don't do, for 20 years and then see who's still alive, who's had heart attacks and strokes. Well, that study's not going to be done. And, and there's no money in it and way too long. And so lifestyle medicine doesn't lend itself to double-blind placebo-controlled to randomized studies. And... Uh, and yet they'll, they'll dismiss it. And, you know, it'll never fly, Orville. You know, that don't tell, we're all seeing these patients get healthier. Don't tell us we're not seeing this. Right. And, uh, and how can we deprive our patients of this? It's so important. So to get back to your question, how long will it take? Um, it's at this point, it's, it's a glacial pace with, and uh, me going around to the individual schools is a slow process. What gives me hope, however, is one, the internet and the, the, the young students talking to each other and sharing their, uh, their experiences on uh, Google Hangouts and various other uh, uh, platforms. And also the public is getting educated with these wonderful movies. Uh, uh, Forks Overnight, there's this wonderful one called The Game Changers that has just come right. out um, about all these plant-based athletes. And so the, we're grooming the public to accept this, to understand it and accept that it's the old hundredth monkey phenomenon, you know, and they were at monkey number 92, maybe, you know, we're, we're, we're stuck at monkey 54 for a long time. Now we're getting up, I think, into the 90s. Right. Uh, but, uh, but the public, they, they, it's in the air. They know, they, everybody knows somebody who, who got on a plant-based diet and got off their high blood pressure medicine or whatever. So between the, the public awakening and the, uh, and the medical students demanding this, I'm reasonably hopeful, you know, we, we saw the Berlin Wall come down in a weekend, you know, society can change very quickly. And the ice caps are melting and people are really concerned about this. And, uh, and to make that connection as you are doing, it's what you're eating is driving um, this global warming. Well, it's driving your clogged arteries as well. It, it's all of a piece you know, on, on every level. And so the, the awareness uh, of the acceptance of plant-based diet for climactic reasons also benefits uh, our work uh, on the medical aspect as well. It, it all converges. Uh, it's the truth. And 
We're just looking at uh, various aspects of it. So how long will it take? Uh, really, uh, over the next 36, 48 months, three, four years, I, I view we get enough medical students awake and aware and, and talking about this that I think we're, we're going to start seeing a, a great shift mm. because uh, I'm, I'm rambling on here, I know. No, no, uh, please. <laughs> but there's another factor, of course, and that's the money. Um, the the current uh, the current medical system is going bankrupt, paying for all these procedures and the bypasses and the, the heart attacks and all of that. Um, well, people get healthy on plant-based diets, and the billions, the trillions of dollars that will be saved in chests not open and scans not done and ICU beds not occupied, uh, the uh, the insurance companies are, are making out like bandits. So the folks who are uh, who are uh, sponsoring uh, plant-based programs like Kaiser, um, mm -hmm. they're making lots of money because as their patients uh, go go more plant-based, uh, they're saving whole whole lots of cash. Um, there, there's powerful uh, forces aligned to uh, to help this transition happen. I just hope we have enough enough time to do it. If we had 50 years, no problem. We definitely get it done. But we right. only have 50 years, so we got to get on with this, which is why we're doing this work today, of course. Right. Excuse me. I'm, yes. I'm going to cut in for just a second here. We're yes, having some people say they're having a little bit of a. Um, uh, problem hearing you, you that your voice oh, no. is maybe far away. I, I can hear you fine, and I think people with headsets on. To my microphone here. There you so go. Thank, thank you so much. To them, and uh, let me get a little closer. Hopefully, uh, that you're will saying help. some great stuff. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, important stuff. Um, if you have a minute, let me uh, let me tell you a story um, re Please. regarding this. Um, I have a dear friend, Dr. Kim Williams, who's a cardiologist. He's the, he was the head of the American College of Cardiology. And, um, uh, and he's a vegan. He's been vegan for years. And I found myself on a panel uh, with Kim uh, in Midland, Texas a few months ago. Hey, Kim, how you doing? Oh, okay. I said, I'm just okay. He says, yeah, I got some changes happening. I said, what kind of changes? He says, well, during my day job, I'm the head of cardiology at Rush Presbyterian uh, Medical Center in Chicago. And it's a big hospital, a big referral center. And we have, uh, I, in my department, I've got 25 cardiologists uh, under, uh, under me because we're a big referral center. And I said, yes. He says, well, because of who I am, 14 of those cardiologists are vegan. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow. I said, wow, your, your patients really must get some great care. I said, oh, yeah, we, we assign them a, a plant-based dietitian. We take them shopping. We stock their freezer <laughs> up. We show them how to make all this. Absolutely. I said, wow, you must get some great results. He says, oh, yeah, we do. I said, what's the problem? He says, well, these people come in with these clogged arteries and chest pain and blue legs from the art arterial blockage. Yeah. Well, you get them on a plant-based diet, yeah, and you never see them again. <laughs> the, 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 their arteries open up, and and their angina goes away, and they're, they're healthy. They don't need us. And I said, well, that's wonderful. He says, yeah, for the patients, but meanwhile, um, the income that our department generated uh, is is taking a nosedive. And I said, that's, that's kind of funny. He said, not really. We got called in by administration. Mm -hmm. He said, what's up with you guys? Um, you used to be a profit leader here. Now you're a loss leader in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And Kim says, well, what's happening is that we're curing our patients. That, that, that is what we're supposed to be doing, isn't it? He said, yeah, but we got a multi-million dollar budget to run here. And you just blew a hole in it. And mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so, I, so it became very evident to Kim and to all of the people at, at Rush that the way the bean counters are, are sorting the beans has to change here. Right. I, I was at the Plantrition Project uh, meeting and this tall lean guy comes up to me and I thought he was another doc, but he introduced himself. He says, no, I'm Ken Beckman. I'm, I'm the head of um, 
plant-based insurance actuaries. Mm. I said, oh, he says, yeah, we calculate the odds of, of bad things happening. And it's obvious the vegans are the best insurance risk because uh, they don't uh, generate all these diseases. And, and he's plant-based himself. And he invited me to take part in a, in a seminar for the plant-based actuaries. And he says, Doc, uh, the, the money's got to change the way it's flowing there because there's value for mm -hmm. every CEO that doesn't go down with a heart attack. There's value to the community for every young breadwinner that doesn't go down with a colon cancer. There's value there. And, and medical care is kind of a black hole. You, 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 he says, by the time we pay for a four vessel artery bypass in the heart, by the time we pay the surgeon, the anesthesia, and the ICU, et cetera, costs us $250,000. Well, right. for every person who doesn't go down with a heart attack, we're sitting on that $250,000. We'll, we'll be happily pay the doctor $10,000 for keeping his patient healthy. We'll pay the patient $10,000 for staying healthy. We'll pay the, we'll, the clinic $10,000 for good support care. And we're still sitting on $200,000 profit. He says, the money's there. We just got to see that there's value in keeping people healthy and, and, and reward. That's called value-based compensation. And yes, you know, and that's what's got to start happening. The whole model, the old one has to crumble and a new one take its place where people get rewarded for being healthy. But there's money to be made and lives to be maintained on a, on a whole functional level. If we if we get out of this disease model, so right. the old order needs to change it. But it's uh, but good change is happening. And and again, the more we open to this idea of plant based world, uh, plant based life, you know, everyone benefits, including the polar bears and the and the earth. But uh, so will the insurance companies and my patients as well. Right. Interesting times. Yeah. Yes, these are interesting times. You know, it's the model changing and then the people resisting. The model exactly. changed because yes. they <laughs> yeah people are afraid of change but uh, right. you know if, if you're if the train is taking you over the cliff get off that train you know and, right and that's that's what the uh, your summit is about now and uh, it's so important uh, oh yeah just uh, the birds are disappearing I just saw an article and I can hear that the, the skies are a lot more quiet than they were when I was a kid and right uh, you know the uh, so much of the natural world is, is disappearing is fading away and people are got their face in their cell phones and they're totally oblivious to this but they don't realize what they're losing and, uh, and that's why i'm so grateful that you're doing this work and calling everyone's attention to uh, the importance of saving what we've got and it's so uh, it starts with the food on our plate as as you're making evident here yeah in fact uh, i have a story about that you know <laughs> it, uh, mm -hmm. when, uh, when we were growing up i used to go out uh, on the anniversary of my grandfather's death, he would mm -hmm. make a feast and leave it out for the birds to eat. You know, so this was our very way of nice. remembering. Very and and, and uh, this, is where, this is the way our society used to feed the birds so that you know, they always had some food because every day someone's grandfather had died. So, <laughs> so they just had yes. to figure out where it is, right? And... Right. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I was uh, visiting India when, uh, and the anniversary of my parents' death happened. So I asked my sister, why aren't you doing that? Because I remember calling the birds and I remember, you know, it was, it was great that we were doing it as kids. And she said, go look outside and tell me how many birds there are. There are no birds now, you know, there are hardly any birds. This is why we don't do it because if the food is not eaten, it's an insult. That our ancestors didn't come back. <laughs> oh my! Yes, yeah. that's, so, that's a lot in that story. Right. There is a lot. Yes, this is why these days I'm putting food out every day for the birds in Arizona, sure and why. they they know they have to come here every day and they get their food. <laughs> so yep. this is my way of telling them I need you, I want you, I want you to be here. As yeah. well, you know? Absolutely, I give our local birds the same message. Absolutely, <laughs> and they know we we care. Absolutely, we care. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Deborah, are there any questions from the audience we can field? Deborah, uh, questions? So there's a question on, on Facebook about 
and, and you've already touched on this a bit, but I think maybe you could say a little bit more about it. There's a, a question about, do doctors want to keep their patients sick for the money because of the money? And, and I personally would like to hear a little bit more about when you talked about how to redirect the, the money flow so that you know, so that people are still making money and there is, what did you call it, value-based incentive right. um, for, for keeping people well? How can we spread that? Right, absolutely. And uh, my heart aches every time I hear uh, that line of reasoning, uh, because the truth is, uh, certainly not all doctors are saints, and some of them have personalities that uh, the local warthog is, is easier to get along with. I agree. But I don't know of any physician that went into medicine for the money or, heaven forbid, would keep people ill in order to get more money out of the system. Uh, we, we, we value our sleep more than anything. And uh, we, we, no one's looking for extra sick people and extra work, work to do. And uh, uh, granted, there are unnecessary procedures, et cetera, done. Uh, but um, most physicians I know are getting so discouraged with what medicine is turning out to be. It's not why we went into medicine. We really went in to cure people. Uh, and they wind up in, on this dismal merry-go-round because they don't understand what they're looking at. And, um, and their obese, hypertensive, diabetic patient comes in. They, the, heaven forbid, ask about what they're eating. So it's etiology unknown. And that reduces the doctor to writing another prescription for metformin, another prescription for statin. They, All right, take these pills, come back in three months. And that's the end of the visit. And that's a dismal way to practice medicine. And, uh, and the patients don't benefit and the doctors don't because they're all, are, you talk to them, oh, my baby, they're just all just getting fatter and sicker. That's right, doctor, because you don't talk to them about what they're eating. And the, and the tragedy is compounded because uh, in my slide presentation to the students, I, you know, I have a slide with all the list of all the classic diseases, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, uh, clogged arteries, autoimmune, et cetera. And I click the slide and this question comes out and, and I tell them this is a little inflammatory, but the slide says, you want to heal these patients or don't you? I mean, really, why'd you go into medicine? Want to heal them? Then get real about what they're eating. Stop playing this etiology unknown and stop not asking them about your di their diet. That's why they're sitting in front of you. You want to heal them or don't you? If you don't, then you're facilitating their disease. You're, you're an enabler of their disease. You want to heal them? Then get real about what they're eating. And as I said, you don't know anything about nutrition, then send them to the dietitian who does, uh, but get them off that merry-go-round of disease. And, and the good news is medicine becomes fun again. And, uh, and the money will be there. And the cardiologists, will, they'll do community cardiology. They're, they're not gonna be a lot of unemployed doctors around. You know, there'll always be something for them to do. But to keep the, the, the businesses going next, next bypass, next bypass, and not talk to them about why they're laying on that table in the first place is, is, is unethical. It's malpractice as far as I can see. And, and I use some pretty dramatic terms when I'm talking to these students, but that's what it comes down to. Yeah, Because yeah, if you don't want to heal these patients, then, then, then you can't really cause you, call yourself a physician. And, and the irony, you know, that medical science, we can identify a genetic mismatch on gene A21 on chromosome 14. Boy, that we could home in with precision. But the thought that cheeseburgers and pizzas might be clogging up our patients' arteries, is, this is too abstruse a concept <laughs> for my colleagues to understand because they're eating the same stuff themselves. And, and that's got to stop. There's nothing more tragic than a doctor walking in with a big pot belly and a, and a pocket full of pills and, uh, and they're on statins and beta blockers. And that's no example to set for your patient. The doctors, as we spoke at the beginning, you know, self-care is, is, is an important part of healing this planet. So the doctors got to get themselves healthy and they got to get real about healing their patients. And if they do, medicine becomes fun again. I tell them, you know, you can be the happiest doctor you know because your patients will get healthy. And isn't that why we went into medicine, really? So it's not a matter of keeping our patients sick to keep the money going. It's no matter how much the, the surgeon is making, when he drags himself home at midnight after doing 
the same, you know, done five bypasses that day for what? So their patient can go out and eat more cheeseburgers and more fried chicken because nobody's talking to them and then clog up their graphs and come back for another redo. That's, that, that's dismal and depressing. Uh, none, none of the doctors are enjoying that no matter how much money they're making. So, um, so I'm hopeful as this message gets out that, and the j- glory, the joy of lifestyle medicine that really reverses these diseases starts permeating the medical model. Uh, I have hope that uh, more and more docs are going to jump on this bandwagon and, uh, and we'll save a lot of money as well as saving a lot of lives. So uh, no, I, no time for cynicism here. It's time, time for right. open to new ideas, and actually old ideas like eating plants. Uh, and, and action with some, and some courage is needed. Uh, if the old model is going to break, let it break. We, we, we can do better than this. That's for sure. Right. Excellent. Thank you. There's a question. Um, well, there's a question, another question on Facebook about pharmaceutical companies and how they mm-hmm. financially play in with oh. doctors. And then there's a question here. Can you please describe how a new system based on the value-based incentive would really work? And where would right. hospitals get their money? So I don't know if that kind of all ties together sure, into that question. No. Right, I can certainly understand that. Um, the pharmaceutical companies, bless them. And, uh, and I've got nothing against pharmaceuticals. Someone's got a bad low mark pneumonia and they got 104 fever and they're coughing up pus and blood that give them some antibiotics. And thank God for those companies that make those amazing drugs. They can be absolutely life-saving. But the, but reversing disease is not an equal restoring health. Health is something you earn every day by the choices you make. Uh, health comes from healthy living. And uh, you know where, where that goes. And the pharmaceutical companies have, do not have clean hands and they've done their work uh, of, of subverting the medical education process. And, and you know, I'm I get up in front of the students and I tell you, I want to give you first, second, and third year students this lecture before pharmacosclerosis sets into your brain where you think the only thing that will help people is a drug. That's, I coined the term of pharmacosclerosis. They get so rigidly fixated on this. Uh, and the pharmaceutical companies are happy to, to abet that, uh, that process because we all know um, who and just makes the money from that. And med- drugs were never meant to be taken chronically like this. They should right. be used as an acute, if you break your ankle, you're going to need a crutch for a few weeks, but then you uh, leave the crutch behind. And the same thing with all these medications. You shouldn't need chronic medications by and large. Um, how will the, um, and so the farmers who, have, uh, you know, we need to call them for what they are. This way we ought to get pol- money out of politics and call dirty political practices for what they are. Uh, the same with medical education and, and where, they're, where they can be helpful, fine, but when, when they inject a bias uh, or, uh, uh, or, or really skew the model of healing, uh, that needs to be called out clearly. And uh, uh, I encourage my students to maintain a critical eye whenever the big pharma gets involved here. And how would um, the value-based uh, uh, medicine really work? Uh, there's variations on the theme, and I'm not really the right guy to ask. I'm just a frontline old GP uh, in the trenches here. Uh, but the uh, but there's a lot of variations that you can imagine where, uh, in some ways, the the model of concierge medicine, where you where you pay you know a set fee once a year, uh, and uh, and from that pool of money, uh, the doctor gets paid, and uh, and you have access to the physician. Um, there's lots of variations on that theme with community uh, uh, participation. Um, one thing that Medicare is starting to pay for are group visits, and they work quite well. Um, where the, the single doctor, the single dietitian, doesn't want to, you know, give the same talk on how to make a smoothie twelve times a day, uh, but you can. But the doctors in the evening, their their offices are empty, and uh, in the waiting room of your office, you can set up a table and a blender and a hot plate and call in the local dietitian and bring fifteen or twenty of your patients in. Uh, give them a little cooking class, talk to them, show them a little movie, you know, do something to educate them. And you can bill for a group visit uh, where the doctor and the dietitians wind up with some nice coins in their pocket and everybody's been benefited from this very efficient use of, 
uh, of resources. So there's a way to where there's a will, there's a way. And if we just think about it, the tools are laying all around us. The opportunities are laying around us. We just have to see them in a new way and, and break down this old model of disease care. What would it take to get people healthy? And, and, and the money will follow. Uh, there's, there's smart folks who will figure that out. Beautiful. So Any there's one more question related question. to that, and then we'll get to some health-based questions that are coming in. This one sure. says the value-based compensation seems critical to this process. I know of an organization called upliftmutuals.org in Pune, India, that is doing remarkable work to pull disadvantaged communities out of poverty by giving them control on their health care via mutual aid. Are you That's... seeing connections between your work in the West and this kind of work in India, which is not necessarily in the realm of veganism, but definitely aligned with the new model you're referring to. Oh no, that's beautiful. That's yes, that's that's the kind of model that needs to be incorporated. That's a brilliant idea. I'm all for anything that works. I'm a complete pragmatist when it comes to medical care. If it works, let's do it. But awesome. I haven't seen that particular model used. But I'm but what now that you mentioned it, watch. I'll read an article next week. So some medical group in Pennsylvania is going to start doing that. Watch. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Okay. So there's one here that says, Can you talk about your experiences with vegetarians who consume dairy and what are the main health problems they face? Vegetarians the, versus vegans, I think is this question. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Uh, vegetarians versus vegans. Um, I'll be glad to uh, uh, I'll go into that. Dairy is a real uh, con issue of mine. Before I do, I don't want the, our time together to disappear without people uh, learning about our, our work. Uh, if people want to learn what we're doing and how to support us, go to my website, drclapper.com, and it's all spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-K-L-A-P-E-R, drclapper.com, and click on Moving Medicine Forward. And you'll see it is right on the landing page. You'll see moving medicine board. If you click on that, uh, those are one page describing what we're doing. And yes, there's a little box that if you want to support us financially, where you get a tax deductible donation. But for my concerns, the more important box right below that says if you know a medical student at a medical school or someone who's on the faculty of a medical school and are interested in having Dr. Clapper come and give this lecture, click here, give us their information and we will contact them. And I really invite people who uh, may have someone at a med school that if they'd like me to come and talk, uh, please go to our website, again, drclapper.com, click on Moving Medicine Forward and you'll see how uh, you can uh, help uh, move this forward. Uh, now, as far as the dairy, the vegan and the, and the uh, vegetarian, uh, I did much of my growing up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. I milked and cows since I was eight. Uh, and besides it being a cruel industry, kind of requiring the, those calves to be taken away from their mothers and the mothers are slaughtered and it's just a bloody dreadful uh, 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 industry. The... Um, the, the problem with the product itself, cow's milk, is baby calf growth fluid. And it's meant to blow a little 65-pound calf up into a 700-pound cow in a year. And it's full of growth factors and proteins and hormones that, that make growth happen. And if you're a woman with a breast lump, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. If you're a guy with a little prostate tumor uh, and you're consuming baby calf growth fluid, the, the, that little prostate cancer turns into a big prostate cancer. Um, the, uh, and this milk is, is one, it's not clean stuff. Um, the cows get leukemia, bovine leukemia. You get the bovine leukemia viruses in the milk. Uh, all the pesticides and herbicides that are sprayed on the grains that the animals are fed, that winds up in the milk. The antibiotics that the cows are given, that winds up in the milk. But very importantly, um, these cows are pregnant. Uh, when, on my uncle's farm, and when a cow became fertile, we'd lock her up and, uh, and, uh, and man from badger breeders would inseminate her. And she'd stop giving milk. She would dry up. Pregnant mammals don't lactate. There's a good reason for that. Uh, but uh, on today's modern dairy operations are milking 1,000, 2,000 cows a day. They can't afford to have their best milkers go offline for months at a time while they're carrying their next calf. 
And so they've genetically modified the cows and today's dairy cows are all pregnant uh, with their next calf. Uh, and so the milk is being sucked off their large pregnant bovines. The estrogen content of this milk is through the roof. You know, is that important? Yes. Why are our little girls going through puberty at age eight and nine and 10? Uh, from what could it be from this river of milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt full of cow estrogens that they're shoveling into them down their throat there. Um, the, uh, the fibroids these women get to make them bleed and need hysterectomies, uh, that's from, from the estrogens. The uh, uh, guys get man boobs from, from the estrogens, uh, breast lumps, breast cancers, all these are uh, connected with this estrogen rich milk for what? For, uh, would you drink the milk of a moose? Would you put dog milk on your cereal? What is, what is so magic about cow milk? You know, it, it's, it's an unnatural, dirty substance meant for baby calves. Yeah, I tell people, go look in the mirror uh, in the bathroom there. If you've got a big tail and big ears and a whisker, your baby calf, okay, enjoy your yogurt. But if you're not, um, then see it for what it is. Uh, there's so much else to pour in your cereal these days. There's almond milk and rice milk and oat milk and hemp milk and all these lovely plant-based yogurts and all that. There's really no reason to be consuming cow's milk and a lot of good reason not to. Plus, their uh, dairy operations are environmental nightmares with all the manure and the methane and all the, the suffering that they generate. It's time to just like with all immediate, it's time to turn the page. We used to do that, you know, we used to you know, raise millions of animals and kill them. We used to strip mine the oceans. We used to uh, kill whales. We used to buy and sell black people. There's a lot of things we used to do. It's time to say that's who we used to be. It's time to turn that page. It's time to become plant eating homo sapiens. And, uh, and everything will get better. Our bodies will heal. The, forests will heal, the waters will come back, the soils will stabilize, the greenhouse gases will be sucked out of the air, the, this earth will, will heal just for the simple uh, expedience of, uh, of adopting a plant-based diet like our body was really meant to run on in the first place. So, uh, so everyone benefits there. But I would urge people, the first thing to get out of your diet is the dairy products. It's responsible for so much in the way of asthma and colitis and sinusitis and uh, so many diseases associated with, with dairy products. Uh, you won't miss it. And, uh, uh, and it'll certainly help the cows and the calves along the way as well. So uh, I could talk all day, but uh, I don't want to uh, go way over on our, on our time here. But uh, dairy products are, are certainly no favor to uh, humans cows or the planet. I look forward to the day when we can have the conversation of we used to do this. Thank you for painting Indeed. that picture. Right. Thank you. Yes. So do you have time for a few more questions? Oh, I do. I'll okay. sit all day. Is, uh, okay, I'm good. More, more concerned about your time. <laughs> no, I've enjoyed it. I'm having a good time. Okay, good. All right. So this question says, what percentage of people cannot go plant-based either due to damage they've done or some other reason? Is that a... a Thing. Right. I hear that from time to time. Really, um, I, we have the same basic digestive system that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have, where we came, we evolved through the simian line, through the ape line, and we've got basically that same digestive system. You don't see apes, you don't see gorillas uh, running down antelopes and, uh, and tearing their flesh. Well, they're, they're plant-eating creatures, and all the great apes are. And we really need to honor that. And we've got this lovely plant digesting um, digestive system with fingers instead of claws and, and starch digesting enzymes in our saliva and great long intestine. We, we are plant eating creatures and we need to honor that. And most people have no problem making this, uh, this transition to having uh, fruit and, and oatmeal and porridge in the morning and lunches and dinners, big colorful salads and hearty vegetable soups and big plates of steamed green and yellow veggies and Indian curries and Mexican chilies and uh, Chinese stir fries. And most people have no problem with that. Um, now, some folks um, may have to start out gradually as far as uh, the amount of beans they eat, and maybe just a tablespoon uh, at a time till their intestinal flora changes. They've got to chew this food. This is high 
fiber food. You've got to break down those cell walls to absorb the nutrients. And if people are eating and talking and shoveling that food in, then they swallow a lot of air and unchewed fibers and give themselves a lot of gas and distension and they blame the beans and say, I can't eat this food. But really, if they just slow down and chew every mouthful to a puree, uh, this food usually slides right down with, with no problem. And start with the food you like. Most people like mashed potatoes and corn on the cob or uh, garden peas or whatever. Start with the things you like, uh, with the ethnicity that you like, whether it's you know, Chinese, Indian, Mexican, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, food's got to taste good and, and work with it. The, the body may take a few weeks to make the transition for your gut bacteria to change all that. Be patient, chew the food well, eat, eat small amounts of each fine kind of food to start with, and uh, your body will, will adapt. Very, very few people can't uh, do a plant-based diet. I don't, I don't know anybody who can't eat some kind of plants, absolutely. That's what we're meant to run on. Yes, and, and I'll add to that from my own experience. Um, I. 35 years ago, I had ulcerative colitis, fibrocystic disease, and hypoglycemia. Healed it all through plant-based diet and through cleansing and juicing and, and, and fasting and all of that. And have been many, many years, 20 plus, 25 plus years, symptom-free. So um, there's a question here that says, a friend of mine says that because she has diverticulosis, she cannot eat anything plant-based. And I was told that originally right. with the ulcerative colitis. So I'll let you take yes. the answer. Oh my, um, again, that's an embarrassment. And on behalf of my profession, I apologize for the profound ignorance behind that statement. That's out of the 1950s advice. Ooh, we got colitis, ooh, low fiber diet, low, low residue diet. That's exactly the opposite of what their body really needs. The truth is the body, the intestinal tract is craving that mass of, of soft, well-chewed fiber to slide along the intestinal tract, nurture good bacteria um, to uh, deliver the, uh, uh, the short chain fats, uh, fatty acids that heal the gut wall. Um, that's, that, that's really ignorant advice that that doctor got from his professor who got it from his professor, you know, bad advice, sclerosis, it, it calcifies in medical education, just gets passed on, no science behind it, but that's what my professor told me. So that's what I'm telling you. Now, it's an ignorant statement. And, and if, and, you know, I, a common Malady these days is what I call hyper internetosis, and uh, people you know, scare themselves from what they read on the internet. But here's one place, yeah, Google the colitis and high fiber diets, and you will see that that is the treatment. And and of course, you know the the the, the gorillas don't get colitis by and large because they're eating the higher these high fiber plant. Uh, meals and they're producing these big soft bulky stools that slide along and and that's what the gut is looking for and that's how you heal a, a gut wall so uh, and not only that the diverticuli which are these out pouchings because there was so little fiber in the diet that the intestinal tract couldn't get a purchase on the stool mass so it's got to squeeze so hard that, it, that the air pressure in the, in the colon wall builds up. And if there's any weak spot in the colon wall, these little out pouchings herniate out. And those are the diverticuli that then get infected. Well, guess what? On a whole food plant-based diet with these big soft stools that are easy for the colon to push along, the, the pressure in the, in the colon decreases and the diverticuli, they close up and the condition basically goes away or at least becomes dormant. And uh, so it's a, it's a high fiber diet really is the definitive treatment uh, for colitis, so uh, for diverticulitis. So uh, not, not to be put off by that. And again, it's, it's an embarrassment that, that my, my colleagues are still dispensing that kind of advice to stay in age. So sorry about that. But, uh, Hopefully thank I you. And, <laughs> and we are all right. evolving together. So thank you for we that. We're all evolving together. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So there's a question. Is it possible to reverse type 1 and type 2 diabetes with a plant-based diet? My grandfather, who is around 70 years, was a vegetarian his whole life. He takes insulin injections now. Is it possible for him to get off insulin? Wow. So this uh, says vegetarian. 
Yeah, important question. Um, and there's a number of layers here. There's two types of diabetes, type one and type two. Um, type one, the pancreas has been injured and its ability to put out insulin has been really damaged or, or, or nullified. And this person is going to be usually needing to take some sort of insulin injection uh, long term. But that's less than 10% of people with diabetes. The majority of folks have type 2 diabetes, which is a completely reversible disease. Um, it's from the fat in their diet. It's from the butter fat and the cheese and the meat and the uh, and even if they're vegetarian, uh, all the dairy fat and the olive oil and the and the fats and the and the processed foods, this the, all these fats clog up the insulin receptors. So when the insulin molecule comes along and says, "Hey, open up muscle cells and, and take this, this sugar in to burn it," the muscle cells don't listen to insulin's message. It's like putting chewing gum in the door lock and the. Uh, and the insulin doesn't work. And so the sugar piles up and then people get high blood sugars. Uh, but the good news is that the pancreas is still putting out insulin. The, the muscle cells are still capable of responding. And if you get all that fat out of the diet, not, not zero fat, but, but you stop the oil and the dairy and the, and the, uh, and the meats and, and the obviously high fat foods, um, the, uh, the body burns the fat in the muscles that are blocking the insulin receptors and the insulin receptors open up and the type two diabetes goes away. Uh, uh, it's a common, we expect it, we type two diabetes to go away, but you gotta get real about the, the, the junk fats in the diet. You know, you need, you need some fats, but get it out of a handful of walnuts, uh, get a piece of avocado, not out of a glass bottle, pouring, pouring oil all over your food for sure. So yes, uh, type two diabetes is a reversible disease. And so find a plant-based doctor or a lifestyle medicine doctor and, to work with, and they'll help you wean off uh, the medications you're on and get you on a really healthy diet. Thank you. So the next question is about, it says, how can bad science journal articles funded by big meat and dairy be countered? They create doubt in people's minds and doubt is their product. Oh my. Well, we live in quite a world these days, and uh, and we see, you know, things that when I was growing up, you took for granted that the um, uh, that the newspapers were, were always telling you the truth, and the magazines were always telling you the truth, and certainly the medical journals. Uh, that was that was the great white <laughs> ivory tower where you go for the the absolute beacon of truth. And now we're finding that uh, that's, uh, all, all those systems can be perverted. People have uh, ulterior motives and, uh, uh, and the meat and dairy folks can fund studies showing the meat and dairy are, are wonderful for you and, and uh, buy enough ads in the journals so the thing gets published. And soon people are talking about, oh, don't you understand, didn't you hear it happened this past week? The doctor said, oh, red meat's good for you again. <laughs> Eat lots of red meat. Uh, that was uh, the, the meat folks got that one into the Annals of Internal Medicine. And it, that, those kind of articles do so much damage and they cause so much confusion, which of course is exactly uh, wh what the purveyors of those products want to happen, just like in our political process, just throw out these terms and confuse people and, and have them associate with you know, unfavorable outcomes. And uh, so nobody knows what they're talking about. Might as well eat anything you want. You know, that's where, where, the, where they want people to wind up. And that's so sad because we do know what makes people healthy. It's a whole food plant-based diet. And, uh, and anything outside of that is, is going to lead to disease one way or the other. Um, the, there's wonderful books available nowadays. Um, uh, dietitian Vasancho Molina and Brenda Davis wrote uh, Becoming Vegan. Uh, Dr. Barnard, Neil Barnard, has a beautiful book on reversing diabetes. Dr. Joel Furman's book, uh, Eat to Live. There's, there's wonderful books to read. I urge people to get uh, in line with these, uh, uh, these teachings. And you'll know what to eat when you, you know, there's only two places. It's, it's when you're pushing that uh, cart down the aisle in the supermarket. You know, what are you going to put in the basket to bring home? And when you're sitting in the restaurant with that menu in front of you, what are you going to order? Those are the two places in our lives. We got to make some decisions about food. And if you stay on the plant-based side and you and you fill that basket up with, uh, with with lots of colorful vegetables, people say, "Oh, it's expensive to eat this way." 
No, it's not. Uh, rice and beans are cheap. You can get a 20 pound bag of rice for five bucks. You can get a 15 pounds of, of beans and lentils for eight dollars and you, you know, live a, a month off of, of, of meals off of that. Uh, the staples are, are cheap and to learn how to make these wonderful soups and casseroles and, and stews. Uh, and you, you make a big pot of it and you coast on it for, for, for a few days in the kitchen. You only have to cook every day, like twice a week, make up these big batch soups and stews and coast on them. Um, the, it's not as hard as people think. And uh, just a little bit of information and a good experience goes, goes a long way. So uh, uh, plant-based eating is delicious and it will make you healthy and keep you out of the clutches of people like me. <laughs> which is what I really, uh, really hope for all of you. Absolutely. You know your doctor's a friend, not as a professional, if you can avoid it. Any other questions awesome. there? Uh, yeah, so there is, um, okay. It, it says, what are some of the best indicators which improve the blood slash urine in, or some other samples in a, long, in a lifelong vegetarian in a few weeks after turning vegan. There are practical experiments of before and after eating meat, like taking blood samples in documentaries, Plant Pure Nation and The Game Changers. The data-driven approach is a proof that vegan diet improves one's health and motivates them, but I did not find such proven experiments for vegetarians. Right. So, um... You know, we can talk about this, and some people insist on seeing this, uh, this type of, this level of proof. But I think, I'm thinking of getting a t-shirt printed up that says, eat plants and get on with it. You know, because ultimately that's what it comes down to. Because as you make this transition, you know, levels of this are going to go up, levels of that are going to go down, you know, the inflammatory markers are going to go this, this, cyber, but, but these are all just blips on the screen. As the months go by and meal after meal of, of soups and salads and greens and curries and veggies, as the months go by and this wonderful whole food plant-based stream flows through your tissues, then the inflammation subsides and the arteries open up and people turn into healthy pain, the aches and pains go away. And it didn't matter what your serum folic acid was and it doesn't matter what your serum calcium, was. they all take care of themselves as time goes on. Uh, Dr. Colin Campbell wrote this beautiful book called Whole, W-H-O-L-E. And that's the point he was trying to make. We get so fixated on, oh, what's the level of dihydroxybutyric acid and what's the level of you know, one, two, the, the, the dihydroxy vitamin D. It's the whole food stream moving through your tissues, like every gorilla knows, like every <laughs> buffalo knows, like every giraffe knows that whole food, plant-based food stream going through your tissues turned you into a healthy animal. And that's basically all you need to do. Uh, stay away from the processed junk. Don't eat sugars of food. Don't eat oil out of bottles. Don't eat all this processed stuff in, in colorful packages and boxes. That's the stuff that'll hurt you. But as long as it grew out of the garden or it came off a tree, came, it came out of the ground in its whole form, your body will know what to do with this. And uh, you drive yourself nuts looking for all the scientific uh, uh, validations. Uh, what matters is your level of health, is how long you live disease-free, how good you feel, how well your body functions. That's the name of the game, to, to measure the adequacy of your diet, not, not what your serum folate is. So uh, the, don't worry too much about that. Eat healthy and your body will take care of the rest. But if after six months, 12, 18 months, you're not doing well, then by all means, uh, seek out a lifestyle physician or someone who can help you and, and get those tests done and do the fine tuning you need. But by and large, get on a healthy diet and uh, take, eat healthy whole foods, take a walk every day, laugh a lot, do good work, get enough sleep. Uh, and and uh, you're still got problems in a year or two, give me a call. But, uh, but your, your body by then should uh, be on a pretty good autopilot course of health at that point. Awesome. So this question was was typed in a little while ago. It may be redundant at this point, but it says, can a plant-based diet help with prostate inflammation? Oh, a pro absolutely. Fascinating question. Can a plant-based oh, diet help with prostate uh, inflammation? Yes. 
Uh, and people often don't realize that, uh, and I see with the women with the inflamed bladders, with the interstitial cystitis, and they, uh, and oh, autoimmune disease, and we get on this and that. But, you know, the body's so much more elegant and simple than that. It doesn't dawn on people that whatever you eat for dinner within hours are going to be sloshing around in your bladder, in your urine. And it's often that cup of herbal tea in the evening or the, the coffee or the uh, peppermint, some, whatever, some, some spice, some food that they're eating is really what's irritating the, the wall of their bladder. And, this, and the same thing with guys in their prostate gland. It's often something in your food and it's often coffee or tea or some supplement that's working its way into the prostatic secretions that's keeping that prostate angry and, and irritated. And so uh, it may take a little bit of courage, but just stop all that stuff, get cut way back um, to, again, whole plant foods. Uh, you know, you can use a little salt and pepper, but, but stop all the other seasonings and spices and supplements and, and coffee and teas and all that stuff for a good three, four, six weeks, and then see if your prostate isn't a whole lot happier. It, it often is, and it turns out to have been a chemical irritation rather than infection. People are taking these antibiotics, and it's not getting better because it's not an infection. It, it's usually a chemical ir irritation from something that you're eating. As they say, common things are common, and, uh, and it's often something like that. So, so start with that, and yes, pro prostate uh, conditions can, can often clear up, absolutely. Awesome, thank you. So this one says, we feel so honored that we have had the experience of, uh oh come on, my screen scrolled, sorry about that. Okay, the experience of Dr. Rao and the premiere of Game Changers. We created a Hawaiian Lava Flow Animal Rescue Network evolving into the Hawaii Cow Rescue Network. We have witnessed the evolution of the fast foods offering impossible burgers and beyond burgers as options. Currently, there are news articles coming out refuting the healthful components of these plant-based burgers compared to animal-based sources. What can be done to lead people to the truth of a plant-based vegan lifestyle? Oh, what can be done? The best thing is to set a good example, is to be a healthy vegan yourself uh, and, uh, and not preach, no, no finger waving, uh, just the... the, just the uh, example of who you are when you walk in the room, people will know, uh, they, they will notice uh, you are good health, you have good nature. Uh, the best thing to do is, is set a good example. The second is uh, realize that a taste is worth a thousand words. You want to convert anybody, to, to, don't uh, talk at them, put, put some tofu lasagna in their mouth or put, uh, uh, put something really uh, delicious uh, vegetable curry in their mouth. And if they say, oh, I could eat that, oh, that's vegan food, I could eat that man, you've changed their lives with that. So be a good example, get some really great tasting food in their mouth. Uh, and, uh, you know, if they've got medical issues, you know, lead them to someone who can, who can help them with that. Um, the, uh, again, the best thing to do is, is set a good example. And uh, people will learn, did I lose, a, was there another part of that question? Did I, uh, did I, uh, I think uh, it was something I need to address. What can be done to lead people into the truth of a plant-based vegan lifestyle? Like right. This? Yes. What can be done? And um, and I'm a fan of um, of these Impossible Burgers. No, they are not the bastion of health, and they're overly <laughs> processed. And for coconut oil, yes, 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 I read. But one on a strictly health level, they've got no cholesterol. They don't have the antibiotics uh, from that they feed the animals. They don't have the pesticides and herbicides. Um, that the that the, uh, that the standard uh, beef burgers have, and of course, there's no no animal was placed through that uh, dreadful factory farm system and, and slaughtered, uh, and and the the carbon footprint of these burgers are is minute compared to what actual beef burgers do. So for those reasons alone, uh, they're a transition food. If if a if an impossible burger can help. Joe meat and potatoes guy get off his beef burger. I'm God bless. I'm all for that. And it's a tr it's a treat. Have it once a month. You know, have, it's a it's a treat food. You know, don't eat it twice a day. But um, but I'm I'm uh, when you ask what can be done to help people on a vegan diet, man, if, a, if an impossible burger helps them get there, then yay. I'm I'm for whatever works. And so uh, that, that's another way to help people transition. 
Thank you. Um, okay, what can I say to an experienced doctor from a famous hospital who says vegan diet is problematic, problematic and laughs at me? Yeah, and that's why I'm going around to the medical students and talking to them. That should not happen. And that's sad, that's ignorance, that's arrogance. Um, the man should be embarrassed. And, he's, and no matter what specialty he's in, a famous doctor, a famous uh, how is his high blood pressure patient doing? How, how is his diabetes patient doing? I would ask him, you want to, you want to heal your patients or don't you, doctor? Um, if you do, uh, what are you telling him to eat? Uh, and you know, that's really uh, what it comes down to. And it's embarrassing to hear that. And I'm trying to create a generation of young doctors who don't have that arrogance, who understand that it's very important what the patients are eating and vegan diets are absolutely reasonable. And in fact, they're positively therapeutic and preventative when it comes to these diseases. And that's exactly the kind of attitude I'm trying to uh, make a thing of our dim, embarrassing past. Uh, no, no patient should be uh, running into that when they talk to their doctor about vegan nutrition. Uh, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Check out Moving Medicine Forward and give us a hand so nobody else has to run into that kind of response. It's embarrassing in my profession. But right. times have to change. Yes. That's what we're doing yes. here today. Good. <laughs> You're doing beautiful work. I love your message. Um, this says, how are you combating the rise of the keto diet? Uh, the keto diet. This is another one of these things. People want that magic bullet. They want that... Uh, uh, the, uh, the magic cure is that suddenly they won't have X, Y, Z uh, problem. Ketosis is the state that the body adopts when you're burning stored fat in your body. And it's an ancient response and it's a beneficial one. And, you know, it harkens back uh, to our ancient foraging ancestors a million years ago on the African savannas. I'm sure, if, you know, there was not infrequently four or five days would go by before you uh, found the next berry bush with fruit on it. And these intermittent five day fasts were probably the, uh, the rule of the uh, of, of survival then. And during these times of no, uh, of no uh, carbohydrates to eat, the body starts uh, burning its own fat. And this signals the body to do some wonderful rebalancing in the system. And it cleans out old cellular debris and it, uh, uh, it you know, exerts an anti-cancer effect. Being in ketosis for a few days is a wonderful thing. And I'm all for, for once a month to do five days on water and dip your toe into the ketosis land and good things happen. Yay. Uh, that's normal physiology. But it, it seems like the Americans have a, have a pet. If, it's, if a little is good, more must be better, right? Well, I'm going to stay in ketosis for three months. I'm going to stay in ketosis for six months. I'm just going to stay in ketosis. I'll do the keto diet. This is not a healthy state. Ketosis is a state of acidosis. This is hard on the kidneys. This is hard on the bones. This is these folks who are setting themselves up for uric acid kidney stone and setting themselves up for gout. Uh, if you want to, if someone came to me and said, Doc, I want to cause a, myself a colon cancer, how can I do that? Oh, well, pack your colon full of meat two, three times a day. That's a good way to do that. These folks, the paleo folks, the keto folks, you know, who are using meat um, to run their body are setting themselves up as a physician. They're setting themselves up for an epidemic of colon cancer, clogged arteries, strokes, diabetes, dementia. Um, this is a diet of death. Um, <clears throat> now they get this initial improvement um, as far as, oh, their cholesterol, they lose some weight because they stopped the dairy and the oil and the flour products. Yay, they're smart. And they, um, uh, and they will notice an improvement in their cholesterol level and their blood sugar because they're not eating any sugar. The blood sugar stays low. So they say, oh, look at all these wonderful changes. But if the physicians who know are saying, well, yeah, they, you get these early improvements. But what are you cooking up in those patients' arteries? What are you brewing up in that patient's colon wall? Are you going to be around, doctor, in 10 years when they pass their first bloody stool from that colon cancer, your diet cooked up in their colon? You're going to be around in 10 years when this lady's joints light up from the autoimmune arthritis that your meat-based diet spawned in her gut? You're going to be around in eight years when this guy has a stroke from the plaque in his carotid arteries that your meat-based diet 
spawn in his arteries. What are you actually doing, doctor? And I tell him, you know, do no harm applies to dietary advice as well. You can hurt somebody with this advice and these people spewing out this keto, paleo nonsense. Um, we are carbohydrate burning organisms. We are sugar burning organisms. And people who, who ignore that are really leading their patients astray. And they're brewing up some nasty diseases in these people's bodies, but they'll be long gone. Uh, uh, the uh, medical care has become so episodic. You see them once or twice in clinic, you never see them again. But meanwhile, the patient followed your advice. Oh, doctor told me to eat keto or they see it on TV and they do that. And, and docs like me are gonna wind up picking up the pieces down the road from all these diseases that get spawned there. So no, a, a diet that keeps you in ketosis is not a healthy diet. A few days, a week in ketosis, fine. But uh, as an automotive analogy, you know, it's like passing gear on your car. It's uh, great to pass a truck, that's wonderful. But you don't want to drive from Los Angeles to Seattle in passing gear. You're, you're, you'll burn out your engine. And, and that's what the key, state of ketosis is. It's a stressful state. Now, don't be staying ketosis for more than a few days. And ketogenic diets are, are harmful without question. Thank you. Um, so apart um, from vitamin B12 and D3, are there any nutrients which vegans need to take care of? Yes, that's a very important question. And on my website, drclapper.com, I've got a video called Thriving on a Plant-Based Diet. And I go into all of these. Uh, uh, by the way, I also have one called Beyond Cholesterol for, for vegans with high cholesterol. So you might want to check that one out. But as far as the um, uh, other nutrients, there's a couple. Yeah, B12, you can't fool around with. Uh, when we adopted modern sanitation, the, the natural sources of B12 dropped out of our lives. And so you need to take some B12 uh, a couple times a week. Vitamin D, we all live inside and you want to keep your vitamin D level over 30 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, otherwise, you're at higher risk for cancers and dementia and things like that. But there are a couple other nutrients. Iodine for our thyroid is really important. We are not living by the seashore scavenging uh, uh, sea vegetables anymore for the iodine. And in some of the, um, uh, of the people who adopted a plant-based diet and don't feel so good, some of them are really hypothyroid from a low-grade iodine deficiency. And uh, so um, make sure you've got something with iodine and some sea vegetables a couple times a week or a multivitamin that, that has 150 micrograms of iodine in it. Um, uh, yeah, don't, don't ignore iodine. Vitamin K2 uh, for your bones is very important to make sure calcium goes in your bones, not in your arteries. Um, and that comes from big plates of dark leafy greens every day. Yeah, they're so important for calcium, magnesium, and vitamin K. So uh, be sure and, and consume that. And these long chain omega-3 fatty acids, omega-3s like DHA and EPA. Um, I, I take an algae-derived DHA capsule. Uh, once, uh, pretty much on, on almost every day, uh, just to make sure. And again, we're, we're not eating huge amounts of sea vegetables and things like we used to. So, uh, so those are the extra ones, B12, D, vitamin K, uh, um, the iodine for the thyroid and DHA for your, uh, uh, for your brain and everything else. Those, those are the nutrients people need to pay some attention to. Great. Including animal eaters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. That that applies to animal people who eat yeah, animal it does. products, uh, not just B12 vegans, because we're deficient for some reason. Right? Yes. Most B twelve uh, deficiency is found in people who eat animals, but they mm -hmm. they don't absorb it. And the animal eaters are spending their lives inside too, and so they get vitamin D deficient. Uh, and uh, so yes, uh, these are these important uh, nutrients. Keep in mind even for the omnivores. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so is it possible that a person is on a plant-based diet, but his cholesterol and triglyceride levels remain constantly high? Can it be hereditary? Uh, yes, it can. And again, that's exactly why I made this little video. It's called Beyond Cholesterol. Go to my website and, and see Beyond Cholesterol. Uh, basically, the point is that cholesterol is not an evil molecule. Or your liver makes it for a good reason, because your adrenal glands will turn it into cortisol, your your ovaries, if you have them, turn it into estrogen. Your testicles, if you have them, turn it into uh, androgens. Uh, we need cholesterol. That's why your liver makes it. That's not the problem. Uh, what happens, though, 
um, is that the uh, uh, the people may make a little bit of extra cholesterol, but that's normal as long as your arteries aren't inflamed. Atherosclerotic plaques are not just globs of grease that stick to your artery walls because your LDL is too high. These are inflammatory lesions. These arteries are being injured meal after meal of cooked uh, animal protein and fried chicken and rancid vegetable oils and high fructose corn syrup and phosphoric acid from the cola drinks and all these chemicals from the processed food, hydrogenated oils, this, this chemical assault on the inner lining of our arteries is what rips up the endothelial lining and allows the oxidized cholesterol from the cooked meats to get in and start brewing these plaques up. So the, it's, it's an issue of inflammation. So what I'm saying medically is there's a difference between the condition of hypercholesterolemia, just an elevated cholesterol, versus the disease of atherosclerosis, which is an active inflammatory process. There's an inflammatory fire burning in the walls of your arteries uh, that's causing this plaque formation. Those are two different conditions. If someone happens to, I've got vegans with cholesterol of 220, but as long, but when I check their inflammatory markers, they're stone cold negative. They don't have the disease. When we get, when we do an ultrasound scan there, they don't have the disease of atherosclerosis. So before you get all panicky and before you buy into a statin prescription, you have the doctor check your inflammatory markers. Those are as high sensitivity CRP and a couple other ones, myeloperoxidase and, and phospholipase. Those, it's all in my video there on, on Beyond Cholesterol. Uh, and have those checked. And if, and if you're treating your arteries nicely, if every meal is just rice and beans and greens and papayas and fruits that give that chemical message to your arteries of Shh, calm down, everything's okay, uh, and you're not injuring your arteries, uh, it doesn't matter that your cholesterol is 215 or your triglycerides are a bit up. Don't, don't worry too much about that at all. Um, there's, uh, well, we'll just leave it at that. There are some supplements that can help, some carnitine, choline things can help and bring it down temporarily. But uh, by and large, uh, if your cholesterol is just a bit up, uh, and your inflammatory markers are negative. It's not a disease worth worrying over. It's not a disease. Thank you. Okay, this one says, I have been vegan for about four years, but I still struggle with high blood pressure. I eat rainbow plants, nuts, whole grains. I have seen naturopathic doctors and done juicing. Nothing brings my high blood pressure down, even tried acupuncture. I've been diagnosed with stage two liver damage. I know that you cannot diagnose but is there hope I can cure my high blood pressure with food? I really am enjoying your presentation. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Um, but here's someone um, who would benefit most likely to, to help. He's a, a good candidate. As I said, I spent eight years at uh, True North Health Center. Uh, here's a, a person who's a great candidate for a water fast. If he went up to True North Health Center, and, and did a 10 day, two week, three week water fast. You're, nobody holds high blood pressure on water for three weeks, it comes down. Uh, and then you, you get them on a really healthy, high vegetable diet uh, after that. Uh, and here's someone who might wanna do some intermittent fasting and maybe uh, once they learn how to do a nice long fast, once or twice a month to do a three day fast over a weekend, a couple times a month to keep that pressure down. So yes, a, um, uh, a water fast could definitely uh, be of help to this person. Um, he, he's someone who uh, for, again, for five, seven, 10 days uh, might wanna just really shift his diet way over uh, to raw foods and soups and salads. And, and that's it, stop all the starches and the nuts and the oils and uh, uh, things that are fatty and starchy, yank them out for, for a week or two and just load up on, on raw fruits, uh, raw foods, uh, big salads, hearty plates of steamed veggies uh, and maybe a day or two on water intermittently there. And, uh, and that pressure ought to come down. But consider going up to True North or to uh, Gracie Ewan's place in Ohio and do a longish fast. And um, it's not a terrible thing. By day three, you're not hungry anymore, hunger goes. And so when I say, oh my God, two weeks without food, uh, you breeze right through it. Yeah, you feel really good during the fast, you're not hungry, it's nothing to be afraid of, but it would bring down your blood pressure. So that's certainly something to consider doing. So check out a fasting program and, and lots of raw foods after that. 
Thank you. Um, okay, here's another one. There are some startups working on algae-based protein as it is more sustainable and has more protein percentage by mass than other foods. Your thoughts on this? Does the world need and such startups? This is algae-based protein? Yes. Uh, algae from, oh, wonderful, great. If it came from a plant, uh, I haven't heard any algae screaming or uh, it's, 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 it seems to be suffering free. Oh, I'm all for that and, and bless them. That's brilliant thinking because you can uh, create a whole lot of algae in a tank in pretty short order with, with not that much um, input. So yes, I'm all for that. And of course it needs to be studied and uh, get in a way that's uh, commercially acceptable and all that. But yay, let's hear it for algae-based protein. Uh, if it came from a plant, uh, I'm all for it. Okay, and this one says that you say to have methylcobalamin B12. Dr. Greger says to have cyanocobalamin. I hope I'm pronouncing those correctly, B12. And this person is confused. Can you clarify? Yes, um, I was recommend, these are types of vitamin B12. Uh, cyanocobalamin um, it seems to be a bit more, bit more self shelf stable. Uh, and uh, a little cheaper, and it's, a, it's perfectly good. It works for most people. Some folks have a have a tougher time converting this into the active form, uh, and where methylcobalamin is already in the active form. And so, because I can't tell who may have a genetic issue regarding activating their B12, I just recommend that uh, everybody just take the methylcobalamin form. But it is a little bit more expensive, and for most folks, they probably don't need it. Uh, uh, so if you're really attached and for financial reasons, whatever you want to do, the cyanocobalamin, great. But do have your B12 level checked in six months or 12 months so along with a blood count and make sure that the, your B12 level is up and your, your red cells aren't getting real big, sign of B12 deficiency. Uh, and, uh, and if any of those things show up, then you want to go to the methylcobalamin. Uh, so that's one way to play it. So start with the cyanocobalamin and then get your levels checked. Yeah. You want your B12 level well over 600. Uh, the, the, the normal acceptable level is 200. That's way too low. People are getting symptoms by uh, <coughs> when it's that, that low. Uh, you want it 600 or higher. And as long as your, your supplement's keeping you in that range, then it's okay for you. Thank you. Okay, any advice for Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, shingles? Oh my, um, Ramsey Hunt, those, oh, that's, uh, ooh. Um, I wish I could wave a magic wand. This is a uh, nasty uh, condition where people get shingles from the herpes virus and it just really attacks their, their facial nerves and uh, uh, they wind up just miserable with this thing. Um, it's been a long time since I've uh, looked up Ramsey Hunt and, um, you know, a possible water fast might help, but uh, right now, unless I do some research, I, I don't have any magic wands to, to wave on Ramsey Hunt. But again, um, that body during the fasting state really resets a lot of things. And uh, um, if I had a, uh, an episode like that, boy, I would jump on a water fast for five or seven days and see if I could, my immune system could, could calm that down. Um, then I think it would be in any program just to do that. Awesome. Okay. Could you repeat the name of the facility in Ohio that provides water fasting? Right. Uh, her, um, this is uh, Dr. Gracie Ewan, last name Y-U-E-N, first name Gracie. If you look up Dr. Gracie's Fasting Center, it's just north of Columbus. And uh, Dr. Ewan was on the staff at True North when I was there. She, she was there for three, four years. She knows how to supervise a water fast. Lovely person, chiropractor, but she runs a nice little ship there and uh, can get you through a water fast in good shape. So uh, check out Dr. Gracie Ewan. Um, Dr. Frank Sabatino down in Florida, down in Deerfield Beach, he has his Balance for Life uh, program. So for people in the Southeast, they could go there. And Dr. Nathan Gersfeld, G-R-E-R-S-H-F-E-L-D, -E -E Nathan Gersfeld, uh, has opened a fasting center in Orange County, I think in Tustin, uh, in California. So those, those are the four major fasting centers that I know that are functional and safe. And I would trust them to uh, supervise good water fast. So there's one in each corner of the country there now. Excellent, okay. Um, all right. Okay, <laughs> strange question. I am a healthy whole food vegan. 
and always have have been always have been thin but now I'm very thin a little too much I'm sorry a little too much as I don't have too much reserve when being sick rarely though and I eat at least 2,000 um, calories of uh, I have a very good appetite. A naturopath suggested to take high calorie vegan protein shake to get more calories. Is this okay? There's something to that. I, I'm generally not a big fan of these protein powders, even the vegan ones. They, they really slam into the kidneys and they, they can be a, a bit of a stress for the kidneys, but they do have some uh, validity in people like this. Uh, two things. One, yes, you can. I uh, would mix in like uh, 30, 40 grams of the uh, of the protein powder, but you don't chug a lug this down. You sip it over the course of the day. Take a whole day to work your way through that blender of smoothie. Uh, take a take a mouthful. Put the glass down. Chew it up. Mix with your saliva. Swallow it. Wait 20 minutes. Wait a half hour before you before you take your next dose. So so you don't crash into your liver and your kidneys with with all these amino acids. That's one thing. Second. Uh, this is, um, this is an area where some people have done a lot of research. And this is uh, the folks, those amazing, wonderful people in the vegan bodybuilder community, like uh, Robert Cheek and Derek T and Tree Size and you know, Scott Jurek. I uh, suggest so go to their websites. They have uh, programs on how to bulk up if you're a vegan. And uh, it's going to involve some nut butters and smoothies and, and protein powders, et cetera. Uh, but there are but ways to use nuts and, and which nuts, et cetera. So this is uh, Robert Cheek, C-H-E-E-K-E. -E -E. uh, go to his website, uh, Derek Treesize, T-R-E-S-I-Z-E. -E. Um, even Rich Roll, uh, he's an endurance athlete. Uh, but uh, check out what these uh, experts in physical mus musculature uh, have to offer, and they, they could probably give you some good guidance. But uh, uh, not, and this person, nuts are her friend, and, uh, and a and moderate amount of this protein powder is consumed during the day, probably a good idea for her as well. Okay. Um, what are your strategies to turn doctors vegan? If you turn one doctor to vegan, thousands of people will turn vegan. Is there anything special you would say to a very experienced, in terms of years, doctor who denies plant-based diet and tells to eat dairy and meat? Right. Oh my, uh, they, they say none is so blind as he who will not see, you know, and if they are, you know, they're just defiantly, you know, their mind is not open, their door isn't open, then, um, Someone says scientific change, scientific change really happens in the scientific community uh, when the, uh, the bastions of the old guard die off and the younger <laughs> docs come up and replace them. And that's ultimately what's gonna happen here. Uh, my, my high school basketball coach said, you gotta wanna, man, you gotta wanna. And if you don't wanna, nothing happens. You know, and this guy doesn't, in his current doesn't, doesn't wanna. Um, that said, um, what would I do? I would have him uh, see Forks Over Knives. And ask, are you into, would you be into seeing a couple of films? See Forks Over Knives, see Eating You Alive. This is a really done, well done film. I'm not in it. Um, that uh, they, they show doctor after doctor after doctor around the country. Um, and doctors that I had never heard of, which is wonderful. Uh, beyond the usual 18 folks and Dr. Ornish and Dr. McDougall. Now, there's a lot of just anonymous cardiologists and internists scattered around the country with their patients who made these remarkable um, improvements on, with plant-based diet. Have them watch Eating You Alive and, uh, and What the Health uh, and, um, and Forks Over Knives. And then ask what, what they thought about that. And there's an opening there. And uh, have them come uh, to a... Um, uh, to a meeting like the Plantrician Project, if he's interested at all. Yeah, I hope after seeing those two films, Eating You Alive and, and, uh, and uh, Forks Over Knives, he ought to be saying, hmm, that was interesting. Well, so that would intrigue me. Boy, that uh, the guy with the renal cancer, he got better. And the guy with the diabetes, he got better. The patient with the clogged arteries and angina, he got better. I got, that's something, if he's a scientist at all, then, then he should be open to that. If not, then he's abandoned his stance as a scientist, as a seeker of truth. And 
he's going to have to shuffle off the conveyor belt stage right at, at that point along with his colleagues. But the um, uh, but if he's open at all, then there, there's good books. He should uh, get a, uh, check out the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Oh, that's a particularly good one. Go into Dr. Barnard's PCRM.org, and there's a beautiful section on continuing medical education for doctors, and he should educate themselves. But we haven't watched those two films, and that'll tell the story. He's either on, into it or uh, he's not into it, and... Uh, let those who have ears hear. And he does. If he doesn't have ears, he's not going to hear. And I'm, I'm after the young ones who are, who do have ears and who want to hear. Beautiful. Okay. Quick question. You you mentioned the name of four uh, bodybuilders or endurance athletes that mm -hmm. um, had information. I got. Um, oh gosh, where did they go? Are they scrolled? Robert Cheek. Robert Cheek. Derek, which role? Right. Derek Tree Size, T R E S I Z E. Um, Scott Jurek, J U R E K. Uh, he's an endurance athlete. He's the one that ran the Appalachian Trail in 40 days and uh, remarkable. Um, uh, and, um, and Rich Roll um, is another ultra uh, athlete. And um, look up their websites and see what their, their tips are on nutrition and bodybuilding and bulking up a bit. Great, thank you. Um, okay, how does the carbon footprint of a vegan diet compare to that of a local vor, a local vor? Of a local vor. Yeah, right. local vor. Yeah. 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 Could you please point to some resources to learn about this aspect? Well, I'm sure Dr. Rao uh, right. has, uh, has them down his his arm there, as far as a list of uh, of. Uh, resources here and I, you know, I'll defer to him, but there's no question, even if that cow was raised um, in the backyard, um, the amount of methane they built out over his life, the amount of carbon dioxide they breathed out, the amount of, of, of uh, fuel that was burned to, to run the irrigation pumps, to irrigate the alfalfa, to the, the tractor that and the trucks that brought in the grain, the hidden carbon footprint uh, is not evident with in local uh, production. And, you know, doing it locally is better than dragging it across the country. But have no illusions. It's an inherently wasteful, wasteful pro process to raise animals, to convert plant food into animal food. It's so inherently wasteful and has such uh, a uh, undeniable carbon footprint uh, that doesn't that the, the local factor is 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 a, is a tiny fraction of uh, any redeeming feature. Uh, the, it's inherently a, 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 a planet unfriendly process. Uh, so, unless you do you have anything you want yeah, to add? Yeah, transportation to is typically yeah, transportation is typically around five percent of the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, once we get to a completely plant based world then it may become a bigger percentage. So right now we have a completely animal-based world. It's pretty much an animal-based yeah, okay. world. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just such an inherently inefficient process that even if the cows in, uh, is in your backyard there, uh, you're wasting right. a lot of energy and putting out a lot of methane and uh, carbon dioxide into the air, no question. And um, once you slaughter the animal, you gotta keep the meat cold, you gotta keep it frozen. Who's paying, uh, there's electricity being generated for that. Right. Um, on, on every level, it's you got to stop eating animals. Absolutely. Ice caps are melting. It's past, past time. Right. Great. And Julie shares a, a book here. She said a great book to read about for this is Food Choice and Sustainability by Dr. Richard Openlander. Absolutely. Yes, Abs, thank you for mentioning that. One of my heroes is Dr. Richard Oppenlander, uh, who is, he was a dentist, but he, like, like me, gave up his clinical practice to get this message out. And he wrote this remarkable book. The title alone should win the Pulitzer Prize. It's called Comfortably Unaware. <laughs> which is just where the meat and dairy industries want us. You know, the, you just keep eating those burgers. Don't you worry about what it's doing to the planet. You just keep eating that fried chicken. Good for you. Um, comfortably unaware. I urge people read this book and, as well as his companion book uh, on, uh, on raising food in a, in a sustainable way. But uh, check out Comfortably Unaware. That will open this whole uh, 
kingdom to you of, uh, of the true ecological costs of meat-based diets. And it's just devastating. The world will not look the same to you after you read Dr. Oppelander's book. So thanks Thank for mentioning that. Yeah. Thank you. So there is a lot of praise coming in, a lot of gratitude. Thank you so much for your generosity and for all that you've shared and given during this, this Q&A session and the interview itself. Thank you so much. Oh, Thank my you. pleasure. It's just been a delight. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, this has been amazing. Thank you very much. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for doing this, for getting this message out. It is so timely, of course, of course, of course. Is we're all pastime. And, uh, so great to get this message out. And uh, and it's an honor to have uh, colleagues like you to, to work with. It gives me hope without question. Same here, sir. Thank you very much. So um, we got uh, we at the end? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. I believe great. we are at the end of the questions. Again, thank you so, so much for everything that you've given. And uh, thank you, Dr. Rao. And thank you to everybody who has been here and who has contributed questions and information. And yes, lots of more thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you coming in through the feeds on both the Zoom and the Facebook. So thank you so much. Yes, more and more. Um, thank You're you welcome, to both welcome, of you. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> yes. So um, I, I want to invite people who are listening or watching the replay. You're welcome to share this information with with all who have ears to hear and eyes to see. Uh, please share it far and wide and spread the message. And especially, you know, the messages of how people can heal with a plant based diet and and well, all of it, of course. But I think there are so many objections that come from people who have that mindset that in order to heal, they've got to stay within the system, right? And so I really, really appreciate all that you've shared about that. Yes, if, if I can just put a, a bow on it and, and uh, as an homage to Dr. Rao and to you, um, as the physician, I can tell you your body will heal. There's amazing things happen and arteries open up and you get off your pills and you turn into a healthy person but the planet will transform. If, if we could wave that magic wand, if everyone were vegan tomorrow, or as we move towards it, we would need so much less land to feed everybody that the forests could come back and that would stabilize the soils, that the greenhouse gases would wind up in the trees. So there'd be enough water without wasting it, irrigating alfalfa and soybeans. The waters would run pure again without all the pesticides and herbicides and manure the soil erosion where it would stop, the soils would stabilize, um, the, the greenhouse gases would start coming out of the atmosphere, where everything would start to heal, and we would become healthy homo sapiens along the way. Uh, and so if you want to be a planet healer, become a plant eater, uh, basically, right. is what it comes down to, and everything will get better. You don't need to know the science of ecology or, any, or your body. Just eat plants and get on with it, and, and everything will get better from there. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to share this wonderful message with, uh, with all of your viewers there today. Bless you thank all. You. Health and Bless happiness you. to everyone. I, I envision, envision you in the t-shirt that says, just eat plants and get on with it. Get on with <laughs> it. <laughs> I have a t-shirt. I wish I had worn it today. My, my uh, uh, t-shirts say, e uh, eat simply, live joyfully. And it's lovely. Yes. Absolutely. It's it's That's true. Same message. That's yes. great. Um, okay. And Julie says Dr. Clapper is a true climate healer. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. That's a, I take that as a high compliment. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing you on the, tra on the lecture trail. I'm sure our paths will cross for time. Thank you, Silas, for this wonderful work you're doing. Deb. What a great vision you had to make this happen and to get this word out with an official stamp. And, with Deborah and all your, your allies there. It's a great service you're doing for all of us. So thank you. And thank you for including me. Uh, I think uh, it's an honor to have you as a friend as well as a colleague. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Okay, okay everyone. So share this. And tomorrow we'll be meeting back here at the same time, 9 a.m. U.S. Pacific time with Renee king Sonnen, who has a rancher advocacy program in Texas and helps a lot of ranchers transition from their meat and dairy um, industry into more sustainable and all kinds of wonderful things. Anything you want to say about that, Silesh? Yeah, it's going to be amazing. This is part of the transformation that needs to happen, getting the ranchers out of growing animals into growing plant-based foods, 
So we're going to talk about specifically about uh, a chicken farmer that went vegan and then started a mushroom farm. Uh, so that's, uh, and then you'll, of course, you'll hear about Renee's ranch as well. So look forward to seeing that, seeing you all tomorrow again. Awesome. All right. Thank you all so much. We'll see you tomorrow.